Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So he's wrapping up this, uh, he's wrapping up this verse and he, sa he says, I want you to be, it's going to take a lot of strength and a lot of power to go up against the devil is what he's saying. And I want you to be strong. He's, he, it's not going to, it's not going to, a weak person is no match for the devil, right? He says, I want you to be empowered. I want you to be strengthened, but notice where your strength comes from, child of God. He says, I want you to be strengthened in the Lord. So you're going to draw the power source is going to be from the Lord. And then he says, not only are you to be strong in the Lord, in the power, and our God is a powerful God, isn't it? You know, we, we, I, I think, and I have been convicted recently, I was talking to Brother Tracy this week, of how, how often do we try to either do things on our own, or we, we don't even realize we have problems when there's this powerful God who's on our side, who's for us, and we don't even tap into that power all the time. You know, in the, you go read Genesis chapter 1. And I mentioned this last week at Grant Smith. I said, I've been giving y'all homework. Have y'all noticed that? I'll say, go read this one or go read that one. And then the thought popped to me last Sunday that they probably don't like that. Who likes the teacher that gives everybody homework? <laughs> uh, but go read Genesis chapter 1. It says, he made the moon. He made the sun. And then there's this little, just this, a couple of words. Says, he made the stars also. Like it's nothing to him. This is a powerful God, isn't it? Think about, go look at the stars tonight, if you can see them tonight. While you, after you get through reading, go look at the stars. And, um, and, and, and just think about, there's a God that's made the stars also. And he says, I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's his ability. See, you're not able, I said that earlier, you're not able to fight against the wiles of the devil. You're not able to stand up to the devil. I'm not able. But he says, God is able to help you and strengthen you in this battle that we're all going to fight. So he says, I want you to be strong in the power of his might. I love a, that, that we have a God who is able. Remember when Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed. He would tell the Ephesians in chapter 3, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. He is able to do that. This, this church, if you go back and read it in Acts, this church, God, uh, Paul would stand before the elders of this church and he would he wouldn't say, hey, guys, it's going to be a great revival. You're about to experience great joy in the Lord. No, he said there will be people who raise up among you who are going to try to devour the, the sheep. There will be wolves who come in from outside of you who try to devour the sheep. And you know what he says? He says, I'm going to commend you to the Lord who is able to build you up. <laughs> Paul said, I couldn't do it. No other preacher could do it. But God is able. So now he says, finally, my brethren, be strong as we battle this enemy. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in his might. And then he says this, put on the whole armor of God, the entire armor of God. See, if you're going to go into battle, you know, and that's, that's a lot of times discipleship or the life of a child of God, a follower of Christ is the example is given of a soldier, right? Because it is a battle. And so he says, if you're going to go into battle, you know, you want to go in with the entire armor armor that's provided to you if a soldier win remember i had a good friend who's he retired from the army and he said he said I, I could always remember as we would go into battle he said i was equipped with the equipment from the lowest bidder <laughs> he said that always comforted me <laughs> some of y'all get that later but when they when when the when the government's you know putting out those contracts the lowest bidder won he said i would always think about that <laughs> Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able. So here's you being able. You know, we, we've established that God is able. But Paul is telling these Ephesians that if you'll put on this armor of God, you'll be able to stand against the wild that is the trickery of the methods of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Do you see what this is really graphic language? He says we wrestle. You know, this, we've all seen a wrestling match. Right? There's a it's contest between two people to see who can pin the other one. He says, you're wrestling against, not against flesh and blood. That's important to remember, isn't it? People aren't our enemy. There's something that maybe moves people to do things that we, we wouldn't like. But people aren't our enemy. There's an enemy above that that we're wrestling. He says, not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That would be ranked of evil spirits against the rulers, the devil and his demons of darkness, 
of the darkness of this world. That is the, the ungodliness and immorality of this world. And there's a lot of that. There's always been a lot of that. Still is a lot of that. He says, and we're wrestling against this, against the spiritual wickedness. That's, that's evil purposes, evil desires, spiritual wickedness. So he's saying not the wickedness of people, but non-carnal spiritual wickedness. In, listen to this, now he says, in high places. You know what I think that indicates to us is that these, these, these spiritual wickedness, the devil, our enemy that we're battling, he says, he has the high ground. He says, in high places. You know, when they would go into battle, you would want to get the high ground, right? You get a better shot on people. You can see, you could see, you could see whoever you're fighting, whoever your enemy is. You can see where they're moving, where they're going. And he, and what Paul's saying, he really wants you to be sober here. He says, you're fighting the enemy that is in high places. It's an uphill battle for you. Do you see that? And he says, wherefore, because of this, because we have an enemy that we're fighting who already has the high ground, he says, for this reason, you need to take on the whole armor of God. This is an action that we have to take, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That is, that is to remain upright. That, is, that should be our prayer in this life. We want to remain upright. We want to remain on a solid foundation, which would be Jesus Christ, I believe, which would be the Christian way of life. But we want to, if, if you can get to the end of your life, Maybe I'll, I, a lot of times I'll say what I want on my tombstone when I'm up here. Maybe you'll say, he was still standing. <laughs> we want to stand, right? We don't want to fall. And he says, stand therefore. He's going to start talking now about the, the armor of God, the armor that, that, that God gives to us as we go into this battle. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. You see, it's my understanding the girdle is what held the entire armor together. It kind of be like going into a fight without your belt on. And you're, I mean, let's just think about it. If your pants are falling down, it's hard to fight, isn't it? <laughs> and he, so this is very important. <laughs> he, says, he says, having your loins go about with truth. Truth is, y'all know truth is very important. We've talked about that he is the father of lies. So if lies come from Satan, the truth must come from another source, which is God, right? The truth strengthens us. When, when Jesus Christ was praying in John chapter 17, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's a very interesting uh, statement to me that he would, when, when he is praying for these people who he's about to leave, his disciples, he, I believe he's praying for us too, that we're represented there. He says that the way, see, you were sanctified, you were set apart in God before the foundation of the world when God chose you and, and, and placed you in Christ uh, to be redeemed. But there's also sanctification that takes place in this life where we grow more like him. That should be the goal of it. That is what a disciple is. It is the discipline of becoming more like their master, becoming more like the one who they follow. And how are we going to do that? He says through the word of God, the precious word of God, the church. The church is called the pillar and ground of the what? Truth. Y'all remember that sign we talked about there on I-65? Go to church or the devil will get you. <laughs> a lot of truth in that. You, you need to be where the truth is proclaimed, where the truth is loved, around people who love the truth. Because the truth, as Jesus said, will set you free. See, the deception and the lies of your enemy will put you in bondage, but the truth, Jesus says, will set you free. So he says, stand therefore having your loins scored about with truth. That's going to be very important. That's the, that's the belt you put on to hold all this armor together is the truth. What holds the, the church together? Is it personalities? Is it programs? No, it's the truth of the word of God. And he says, stand there having your loins scored about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate is going to cover your heart. If you don't know that, that's a very important organ. <laughs> He says, you're going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I believe, number one, what he's talking about here is that when we go into battle, and we're, make no mistake about it, we're in a spiritual battle with people who want to, to have us, that they may, with, 
with, with demons and the devil who wants to have us, that he may sift us as wheat, that he may do whatever he wants to do with us. We don't need to go into battle with a condemned mind that we don't measure up to what, that, basically that God does not love us. Do you see that? That's what Satan really wants you to think, is that there's no way that God could love me. Remember when Jesus was going into, in, in Matthew chapter 3, at the end of Matthew chapter 3, he's going into the wilderness to be tempted. There was a voice from heaven, and I believe it was a booming voice that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I, that, that indicates to me that even God the Father knew that as Jesus was going in to be tempted, it was good for him to be reminded, and it was good for everybody else to know, that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And see, I believe the world and the devil will try to tell you that, God, there's no way God could be pleased with you. There's no way you could measure up. But see, you're, the, the, you pleasing God has nothing to do with the things you do, or the things you say, or the actions you take. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ did, because he was made to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. When you're going into battle, remember that you are righteous. I believe it's also true here that, that we need to be doing the right things. We need to be trying to live a righteous life. I had a roommate in college, and his grandmother would say, and I don't know if I can say this at church, but he said, if you hang around poop long enough, you're going to step in it. <laughs> Talking about the friends you have. <laughs> it's hard to get in trouble when you're doing the right thing. How many fights break out at a Bible study? I'm probably, there's probably been a few. <laughs> But very few, right? We need to be doing the right things, be in the right place at the right time, and you're probably not going to get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you understand that? Just doing the right thing. He says, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That word preparation is the preparation of troops for a campaign, preparation of a nation for a war. Uh, it's, in, it's intended to uh, prevent evil or secure good. He's saying, here's something you need to prevent evil in your life. Have your feet, he's talking about your shoes, shot about with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, shoes are very, we talked about the belt, but shoes are very important. How many of y'all ever had a bad pair of shoes? <laughs> I used to run, I'm talking about before every grace, me and Carrie would run, like 5Ks and things. And so this year, Carrie decided that she would start the couch to 5K. Y'all ever heard of that program? You go from nothing to you're running a 5K in like two months. So three miles in two months. And she had done a few of the, the, the exercise where you run so many minutes, you walk so many minutes. And I thought, I'm going to go run with her. This was in January. And I got about half a lap in with her, and my legs were hurting so bad. They felt like they were going to fall off. And I said, Carrie, I must have some bad shoes. <laughs> I never considered the fact that I had not run in 10 years and I'd gained 50 pounds. I said, it must be the shoes. <laughs> so I got some new shoes. Turned out it was not the shoes. <laughs> but shoes are important, aren't they? Think about Think about your boots of a soldier. Who wants to go into battle in flip-flops? Would, would you want to charge? Uh, you think those, those boys would want to charge in Normandy in flip-flops? And what he's saying is when you prepare, your life is prepared and consumed. And listen, this is preaching to me too. With the bad news of chaos, the bad news of a world that's out of control, he says, you're not prepared to fight. You need to be prepared with the good news of the gospel of peace. And that only comes from, from right here at this church, from right here in this word. It's good to know what's going on, but don't we get consumed with it? I do. But he says, if you want to go into the spiritual battle, Satan wants you to be consumed with the bad news of bad things. He says that you need to have your feet shod with the preparation of of the gospel of peace. And he says this, above all, now here he's saying, here's, here's something that's most important. He says, above all, taking shield of faith. That's a, that's a big four-cornered shield. I believe that word really means a door. It's a big shield that, that soldiers would carry. He says, you need to take that shield of faith, whereby, he says, wherewith he shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked 
So what he's indicating here is that the wicked, these spiritual forces that we battle, are going to constantly, year after year, month after month, week after week, they're going to be firing these darts at you. And he says the way uh, that we stop these darts is through our faith through the faith that God has given us. John would say that this is a victory that overcomes the world, our faith. You know, there are people who are really good. We talked about Satan knowing the word of God. There are people who I've seen, whether it be on the internet or TV or read about, who know the word of God a lot better than I do, but they're not trying to feed the sheep. They're trying to destroy the minds of the sheep. And there are people who condemn the word of God. There are professors who are very good at making you doubt uh, the word of God. There, there, are, there, are, there are many people, I've heard of many seminaries even, where, 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 men, where people will go in to learn the Word of God, and they come out not even believing in God. That's the work of Satan, isn't it? And what's going to, what's, is your intellectual ability going to, uh, to be able to stop those darts that fire at you? No, it's the faith that God has given you. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. How was the world created? I don't really know, but I have faith that God's given me that God did it. Do you understand that? That's your faith. How do we, how do we know that the world was created in six days? I don't know. I just believe Moses believed, and I got the same faith that Moses did. I'm going to believe it. Think about uh, the, the, the world will try to destroy um, you through, like, your social status. We all want to fit in, don't we? But if you're going to follow God... There's going to be places you don't fit in and people that don't like you and people that won't. You may lose a promotion at work. Uh, you may not be invited to the coolest parties. Uh, you, you, I mean, there could be real consequences to following God in this world. Listen to this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 27. It says this, by faith. Here's that shield. By faith, Moses, when he was coming years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughters, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How are we going to endure through this? How are we going to face the, the social persecution or the things that may come to us by the same faith that Moses had? We're going to look to God, the faith that God has given us. And then he says, take the helmet, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, take the, uh, for a helmet the hope of salvation. You know, when a team's going into battle, uh, one of the greatest jobs that a coach has is to give them some kind of hope that they're going to win. <laughs> If a team goes in to, to, to a basketball game or a football game, whatever it may be, and they just they don't think they can win, they're probably not going to win, right? And see, the hope of salvation, child of God, is that you've already won through Jesus Christ. And he says you need to have it around your head, that hope of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's, that's certainly an offensive weapon. Certainly uh, your, your armor and your... Uh, you're not ready for battle without your dagger, is what he was saying. And, and that is the word of God. And Satan hates the word of God. And what was it that Jesus Christ used in the wilderness? It was the word of God. And he says this, let's finish with this. Praying always, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. He closes in verse 18 after he's given us uh, the, the armor, the suit of armor that we're to wear. He says, I believe something that's very important. He says, praying always. He leads us back to prayer. Prayer is the most important thing that we probably neglect in our life. Prayer moves a God who can move mountains. Prayer moves a God. There's one thing Satan doesn't want to spread, and that's the word of God, the truth of God. And so as we go into this battle, realize we're not in this battle alone. We're all in the battle together. May we pray for each other. May we pray for the ministry that the word of God may spread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings of this life. We pray for Brother Sam as he comes before us today, that he may be able to speak boldly the word of God, that we may be encouraged, we may be built up, 
and that we'd all love each other uh, more today than we did the day before. May you open doors of opportunity in Birmingham, Alabama, that we could speak your truth uh, to those hearts so that you've prepared. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I feel very strengthened and blessed this morning by the message that our brother has brought to us on spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us that um, we do have an enemy and that he attacks us to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he used all of those on Adam and Eve in the garden. But our good brother this morning has been blessed to teach us from Holy Scripture how to fight the good fight of faith. There is a good fight. There's a bad fight in this world. There's also a good fight, the good fight of faith. And I'd like to just, if I may, Brother Josh, put out also here in verse 19 of, Philippians, of Ephesians 6, where Brother Josh has been preaching, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Somebody pointed out one time to me that there was no armor given here from Paul for our knees. We have the helmet, we have the breastplate, we have the girdle, we have the shield, but there's nothing to protect the knees. And it was pointed out to me that the knees are bowed in prayer. That protects the knees. Do you all see that? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Prayer is so essential to spiritual warfare and watching thereunto with all perseverance and uh, supplication for all saints. And then this thought came to me as Brother Josh was preaching to us. Uh, another part, a very essential part of spiritual warfare is hearing the Word of God being taught. He says in verse 19, Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may be, utter, be, may be able to utter the truth of the gospel and for me. Do you pray for your preachers? Hopefully you do. That God would grant us utterance. Paul is asking if Paul needed the prayers of the church, how much more does Brother Sam need the prayers of the church? And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. You know, the Bible teaches us that we're to study to be quiet and to mind our own business. But that statement, study to be quiet, doesn't mean that you're to be quiet all the time. You're to study to be quiet at the right time. But there are times when we should open our mouth and be bold. Let's say Brother Sam was arrested last uh, Sunday about 11 o'clock in the morning for robbing a convenience door down the street. And they put me in handcuffs, haul me off to jail. I've been arrested and charged for robbing the convenience store down the street at 11 o'clock last Sunday. Now, those of you that were here at church last Sunday need to open your mouth <laughs> and speak in my defense, right? So Paul is saying, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Preachers are not to be timid in preaching the gospel. We're to be bold. Open my mouth boldly, 
not, not arrogantly, but boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I want to say this morning that a very important part of spiritual warfare is for us to be in the house of God, worshiping God and learning from his word. Many years ago, a sister at Cool Springs Church where I grew up lost her mother in death, Sister Betty Phillips. Her mother, Hazel, had passed away, and the funeral, I think, was on a Saturday, and Sister Betty was at church Sunday morning. And it was just part of our culture in that community in those days. When you lost a loved one, you just kind of hit out for a few days to honor the dead. I know that may sound strange to some of you, but that was our culture, our tradition. And there Sister Betty was at church, and some were shocked. And her statement was, where else could I be to help me in the loss of my mother than with my church family? I want to tell you, being with you all strengthens me when we're here to worship God. We, we fight this spiritual warfare, but I want to tell you, as I'm trying to live a Christian life, you know what, I, what helps me more than anything else to behave myself? The song says, tell me again, as onward I go, Jesus has washed me whiter than snow. If I go just go to church and all I ever hear is some preacher getting up giving me the Ten Commandments, that's not too much incentive to keep the Ten Commandments. But if you tell me that God loves me and he gave his son to die for my sins, now I've got a reason to keep those Ten Commandments. To please him, not in order to go to heaven when I die, but because I am going to heaven by grace, that inspires me to behave myself. What about you all this morning? That's why I say we're never really hearing the gospel until we hear about Jesus and his death. That's why Paul would say to the Corinthians, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, beloved, it's so important for us to go to church and be in a worship service. A worship service is not just a, a good spiritual cup of caffeine on Sunday morning. <laughs> worship does you good all through the week. And I've heard so many people say when they would miss church due to sickness, Brother Sam, the week just didn't go right. I've heard Sister Joyce Clay say that, and she's been out for three months due to sickness and the virus. I want to tell you, church worship does God's people a lot of good. That's why uh, Paul would say, let's go over just a moment to Hebrews chapter 10, and notice what Paul would say to the Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 13. 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Well, I'm around you all and see you behaving yourself. You know what that does? It provokes me to love and good works. How many of y'all have ever been provoked to anger? I plead guilty. <laughs> but I want to tell you. Isn't it good to be around people that will provoke you to love and to good works? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Paul is telling the Hebrews and telling us this morning not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This is an assembly here this morning. We've assembled together. As the manner of some is. In Paul's day, some had the habit of not going to church. 
And Paul said, don't be like those people. He said, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I think that day is the day of worship. When you meet one another at Walmart on a Friday, why not exhort one another by saying, I'll see you Sunday at church. Isn't that a good thing, beloved, to be in the house of the Lord and to worship our God? And uh, you may say, well, I just don't get that much out of church. Well, that's probably your fault. Come on now. When I was growing up in Cool Springs Church, we had two deaf mute sisters in that church who came every service, every service. They couldn't hear a word. They couldn't speak, but they were there. I, I can see them right now sitting in church. And they would be looking at the preacher while he was preaching. And occasionally you would see them get emotional. And I would wonder, how's that? The Holy Spirit could communicate with them. Do y'all believe that? The Holy Spirit could speak to those dear sisters. Let me tell you, if you don't enjoy church, I understand now that sometimes the pastor is just not studied and doesn't have a message. And, but you know, beloved, when we go to the house of God with the proper attitude, it's just going to be good to be there. Let me tell you, the place is not that important. Jesus said to the woman at the well, she said to him, she said, you Jews worship in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. We Samaritans worship here in Mount Gerizim. Jesus said, the day's coming when you may not be in Mount Gerizim nor in Jerusalem. The place is not important. Would y'all agree with that? The old church building I grew up in, I'd give, I'd, I'd give, uh, I'd give a lot this morning just to be able to walk through that old building. But they tore it down. <laughs> it needed to be torn down. And there was a couple in that church who stopped coming when they tore it down. And I visited them one day and wanted to know why. And they said, they tore my church down. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We can get so attached to buildings. We all have some nostalgia. I do. Tell you the truth, the house I grew up in probably needs to be torn down. It's full of mold. It would cost a fortune to remodel it. But I can tell you, I can walk through there and a lot of memories just flood my soul. I, I told my brother a while back who tends to keep things. I don't think he's thrown a thing away since my mom died in 1985. And he lives there. And I said, you know why memories are so precious? They don't take up any room. <laughs> you can just fill up a place with junk. And if you hear this, my brother, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> but beloved. Let's remember, it's not the building. If a, if a tornado came through here and a prayer never happens and tears this building down, Vestavia Church will still be here. Y'all are the church. And we could gather out here under these trees and worship God. Because His presence is not limited just to one place. In the Old Testament, His Shekinah glory was housed in the temple. That didn't mean that God's presence was just in the temple. God is everywhere present, nowhere absent. And, and, and you know, what we need in worship is for his presence to be felt. I'm going to go back just a moment to the Old Testament, to Psalm 95, and look at a beautiful statement that is made Concerning worship, Psalm, Psalm 95. Let's look at this just a moment. Beginning in verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. 
let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Now, the psalmist is admonishing God's children to come. It takes effort to get up on a Sunday morning and get dressed and come to church. A lot of pastors are very concerned right now about their churches. Brother Josh Coker sent me a uh, a link the other day about an article that was predicting that, that one out of every five churches will not survive this virus because people are staying at home, they're watching online, and I thank God for technology and that we can live stream the program. But I'm going to say to anybody at home right now that's physically able and you're just watching, you ought to be here with us this morning. I'm going to say, man, if y'all don't. <laughs> Did I hear a, I heard a lot of amens from y'all. Now, listen, your presence needs to be manifest in the house of God. And so the psalmist would say, oh, come, get up, get dressed, and make the drive to church. And we have people here who drive an hour to get to church. And, and, I, and I appreciate them. Now, Nelda and I don't have far to go. <laughs> We just walk to church, uh, try not to be late. <laughs> but you know, we need to come. He says, oh, come. Let us, let us. We need a church family. People, because I worship God down on the river by just as good as I can at church. The Bible doesn't say that. Oh, come, let us. You need a church family. I tried to share last Sunday that, that I, I, I need a church family where I can see God working in the lives of all the church members. And I have. I, I've been here 16 years and I've seen God work in the lives of little babies that were babies when I came here. And I've seen God watch over you and bless you and guide you. I've seen some of the young people grow up and get married and now they have children of their own. I've seen a lot of the old folks get feeble and uh, finally pass on to glory. And I've seen God working in your life. How many of y'all realize that God is with all his children? He's working with all of them. Look around you this morning and see a church family that God loves. And he's working in every life. Every one of you is important to God. And in a church family, you see that. And it's a beautiful thing. And instead of us putting one another un under the microscope and finding fault with one another, let's just see how God is working in people's lives. Let us, not me, us, worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Before, beloved before you and I can really worship, we're going to have to bow down. We're going to have to come into his presence in humility, recognizing that he is the creator God. Uh, he is the one that made us. Listen to what the text says. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. God made us. He gives us every breath of air we breathe. Is that enough to humble us? It should be. We need to bow down. I appreciated Brother Trey Keeble calling me the other day and telling me about his grandson who got a full scholarship to a college in Virginia, football scholarship. And the coach explained to, this, to the team that they were all going to have to bow the knee. <laughs> you know what's going on. And this young man told the coach, I bow my knee only to Jesus Christ, my Savior. <laughs> I appreciated that. Didn't, don't y'all, uh, I've got a bumper sticker on my car right now that a brother in North Carolina gave me. Stand up for your country. Now, I'll stand up for America, but I don't want to bow down to anybody but my God. Would y'all agree with that today? And as we gather in his name, let's come here clothed with humility. Humility is the most beautiful garment you can put on except for love. And so, beloved, worship. We are here to worship God. I know our worship is not perfect. 
Hopefully, we're growing in our ability to worship God. You know, worship starts with the first song. And I tell you, uh, the, the, the hymn writer would tell us in verse 1 of Psalm 95, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. When we're singing Amazing Grace, um, I tell you, there is worship in, in all of that. And we honor God and worship God as this is a house of worship. We come here to worship. And I know our worship is not perfect. My brother E.D., who died with a brain tumor when he was in his 40s, 46 years old, would quote that verse a lot during his last days on this earth uh, from the song, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. One of those verses says, Weak is the effort of my heart, and cold my warmest thoughts. But when I see thee as thou art, I'll worship thee as I ought. Our offering of worship this morning, I understand it's not perfect. It, it is weak. Mine is so much of the time. When I get to heaven, I'm going to worship him like he deserves. But I want to be in his house every Lord's Day doing the best I can to worship my God and my Savior and my Redeemer. How about y'all? So we're here in, right now. Did you know we're in God's presence? Are y'all aware that we are in God's presence right this moment? He's here. I know God is present everywhere. I understand that. But when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says they went out from the presence of God. What does that mean? Did they go somewhere where God wasn't? No. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. Nowhere absent. So in what sense did they go out of his presence? In their disobedience. They were no longer blessed to feel the presence of God. How many of y'all want to feel God's presence? You want to be in his presence? You want to know, you, you practice the presence of God in your thoughts, in your mind. You know you're with God at all times and in all circumstances. Isn't that a wonderful experience? And to be able, occasionally at church, God will just manifest his presence in a way that you feel, you know, you have chill bumps every once in a while. You'll hear a message, you'll hear a scripture read, you, you, you'll see some insight, some light goes on. You have an epiphany, and, and, and all of a sudden, your heart is just warmed. Or do you just sit there like a bump on a log? Look at the watch every once in a while and wondering, when is he going to get through? Come on now. <laughs> That's not worship. Worship is listening, learning about your God and your Savior. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And then notice verse, verse uh, 7, for He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Beloved, Psalm, Psalmist not only says that God is our maker, but he's our shepherd. The good shepherd that gave his life for us on the cross. How many of us on a daily basis just think of God in all of his glory? Now, there are many things that are dangerous to our spiritual health and worship. And I want to turn with you just now to a scripture that came to my mind this morning as I was studying on this subject. It's in uh, Proverbs chapter 30. Listen to this. This is a prayer of Solomon in chapter 30 of Proverbs and verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Listen to that. 
Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? How many of y'all want to be so rich that you're tempted to just forget God? Now, I know our flesh says, I'd like to try it. <laughs> but Solomon had enough sense to know. I don't want to be so rich that I would forget God and say, who is the Lord? And then he says, I don't want to be so poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Now, in this country today, I doubt, really, I know there are a lot of thieves, but there's nobody poor enough to have to steal, honestly. They have, we have uh, food stamps, which I think is a good thing for people who really need them. Uh, I'm certainly not opposed to paying taxes to buy some food stamps for somebody who is really uh, in need and can't work. That's a good thing. So in this country today, I don't know. I know some of you said, now, Brother Sam, you don't know what you're talking about. But when you compare America with many other nations of the world, it would be really hard to find anybody in America that is genuinely poor like Africa would judge poverty. But none of us want to be that poor that we would have to go out and steal for a piece of bread for our children. I don't want that. I don't want to be that poor. How about y'all? Do you want to be so poor you got to steal? No. But I don't want to be so rich that I would forget God. Did you know that can happen? God said to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, after he had brought them up out of the land of slavery in Egypt, and they had spent 40 years in the wilderness. In Egypt, they're slaves. None of us are slaves. There aren't any slaves in America today. I wish people could get over that. I don't mean to be political, but let me tell you, there are no slaves in America today. But Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. God brought them out after 400 years. They spent 40 years in the wilderness as pilgrims and strangers living in tents. And finally, God brings them in to the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. They'd been living in the desert 40 years, eating manna and drinking water from a rock. Now all of a sudden, God says, you're, you're in this land that I promised to your fathers. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to live, uh, you're going to eat from vineyards that you didn't plant. You're going to drink water from wells that you didn't dig. He said, you're going to be blessed. And let me tell you, the promised land, the land of Israel, was the most glorious piece of real estate on planet Earth. It still is to this day. It was very fruitful. What a contrast from being a slave to being a, a pilgrim and a stranger in the wilderness to now being landowners. I mean, they moved into great wealth. And you know what God said? I want you to guard your hearts. Because with all of this bounty, you're going to be tempted to forget me. Do you reckon that's where America is today? Come on. How, how many of you have missed a meal lately that you just, you wanted but you couldn't afford it? I remember one time Brother Bay and I pulled up to a Cracker Barrel and there was a group of people going in and they all looked like they were at least 100 pounds overweight. And I'll never forget what Brother Obey said. He said, look, Brother Pastor, he said, <laughs> and they're going in to eat more. <laughs> he just couldn't get it. <laughs> you know, he had lived through two famines. The last time I was in his home in Dar es Salaam, he showed me a year's supply of rice and beans he was able to afford. He didn't plan for his family to ever go through hunger like he had gone through. But you and I, that when I went to Cracker Barrel yesterday, it was a feast. Last night wasn't too bad. 
We are living in a land of abundance. Have we forgotten God? God warned Israel. And I believe he's warning America. Warning me, warning you. Let's not forget our God. See, we're going to worship something. Every human being on this earth is going to worship something. The word, the word worship, and I'll close with this. The word worship comes from an old English word that means worth ship. Worth is what you give value to something. The word ship, in that as a suffix, would talk about shaping something. A lot of words end with the word ship. Now, the word ship there means to shape something. What you value most in life is going to value, is going to shape you. If you worship money, it's going to shape you. If you worship fame and want popularity on social media, that's going to shape you. You worship sex, that's going to shape you. You worship your family, etc. It shape if you and, and let me tell you, those things don't shape us very well. But if you worship God, God begins to shape you by making you a more loving person, a more forgiving person, a kinder person. It makes you a servant. How many of y'all want to be servants? Come on now, if you're, if you're following Jesus, you've got to be a servant. Was he a servant? He said, I didn't come into this world to be served. I came to serve. Who was it that got down on his knees in the upper room and washed the other men's feet? Do y'all know who it was? It was Jesus. He came to be a servant. And as you worship him, he will make you a servant. He'll give you a servant's heart. And instead of just sitting around waiting for somebody to pour you a cup of coffee, you want to get up and pour them a cup. Are y'all getting this today? Worship. Worshiping God shapes us into the kind of people we ought to be. So you're going to worship something. May God help us today to have the proper attitude. Now I want us to sing a song, and, and we're going to sing... A song that we usually sing in the opening of the preaching service, but it's got such a message in it about worship. I want us to sing it, and I know you all know what number it is, 104, brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Would you pay attention to every verse in this song as we stand? And if there's anybody here today who would like to be a member of this church family, you come and let us know as we stand together and sing. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore.